Good morning. On behalf of the good people at St. Luke and First Methodist here in the city of Asheboro, we welcome you to worship today. We pray that God's Spirit will fill you today as we worship together. Even though we continue to worship online, we know that God's presence and God's peace and God's love draws and binds us together. Whether we're sitting right next to each other or whether we're miles apart, and for that, we give God great praise and thanks for all that God does to keep us together during this very difficult time. Today, we are so excited to welcome Reverend Alexis Coleman as our new associate pastor here at St. Luke and First Methodist. Pastor Alexis comes to us uh, and she will be leading the new women and children's shelter and a new faith community at the buildings of Calvary UMC just north of town. We want to thank the Church Development Office of the Western North Carolina Conference for making this possible and also the great support of Wesley CDC. We are so grateful to them and Pastor Alexis, we welcome you with open arms and we are so excited for all that you'll be doing among us and how we will worship and serve the Lord together. So welcome, Pastor Alexis. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alexis Coleman, and I am new on staff at First UMC in Asheboro. It has been many months in the making, but I can finally say to you that I am the associate pastor here. My primary responsibility will be to open the new shelter for women and children and to plant a new faith community at the campus on the north end of town that was formerly known as Calvary UMC. But I'll be here around the campus here on Fayetteville Street a lot. I hope to get to know you as soon as it's safe to do so. I can't wait to meet you, to hear your stories, to hear why you love this church so much, and most of all, just to share God's love and grace with one another. So stop by, call me when you can, let me know who you are and what you do to serve at First UMC. It's a great honor and a great pleasure and a privilege to be here. And I'll be seeing you. Thanks. What's up, Julia? Hey, Claire. It sure is weird not being at church this summer. I wonder if there's a way for us to stay socially distanced, but still come to church. I have just the idea. What about a prayer walk? That's a really great idea. That way, everybody can be at church and experience God without putting their health at risk. When do you think it should happen? How about July 19th or the 24th? Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that'll work for me. Cool. What time do you think it should be available? 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Anyone can come and walk through the stations between those hours. We'll have eight stations set up outside the church, and each one will have a different prayer. That sounds really great. We'll just need to remind everybody to keep six feet apart from other people. Definitely. Bye. Good morning, everyone. I'm busy working on church uh, for this week, and I need your help. Um, we kind of want to continue to, to pass the peace, to be able to, to share that we are a body of believers, even though we're not able to come together where we can still uh, connect with one another. And, and for that, we're asking that everyone take a picture of you watching church this morning, uh, whether it's on uh, your TV or on a computer or even on your phone. And then once uh, you have that picture, upload it to Facebook, share it on social media. And if you can, send it to me, Tim, at fumcashboro.org. We can put faces with everyone so we can all feel connected even as we're still isolating from one another in this time. Thanks a lot. We'll see you soon.
we affirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning, First Kids. I have a few things here and I want to see if you know what they are. Do you know what these are? Hmm. What about these? Okay. What about these? They're all headphones. That's right. And what do we use headphones for? What do they help us do? They help us to hear things better, to hear things more clearly. That's right. If you have distractions around you or other loud noises, then you can put your headphones in and it helps you to hear things clearly. And that's kind of what we need to do when we want to hear God talking to us. If we put our headphones in, we can hear it clearly. So in the Bible, there was a little boy named Samuel and Samuel was serving the priest Eli. And one night he was lying in bed and he heard someone calling his name. So he went to Eli's room, but Eli said, it's not me that's calling you, go back to bed. So Samuel went back to bed, but Samuel heard someone calling him two more times. So he kept going to Eli's room. Eli told Samuel, it's not me who's calling you, but he figured out it was God who was calling him. And he said, when God calls you again, you need to say this. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. God did call Samuel again. And when Samuel said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening, God talked to him. In fact, God talked to Samuel a lot after that, but he had to learn to listen to God's voice first. It's the same in our lives. If we want to hear God speaking, 
we have to listen. So we may not hear an actual voice like Samuel did, but we can hear God talking in our minds and in our hearts. So what are some ways that we can listen for God's voice? Well, you can spend time in prayer. You can spend time worshiping. You can spend time serving others, helping others, and loving others. God can send you messages in so many ways. We just have to put our headphones in and listen. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we want to hear from you. We want to hear you speaking to our hearts and minds. Help us to listen for and pay attention to you. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you guys soon. Now let us approach the throne of grace where we bring forth our prayers and our concerns, joys before the Lord this morning because we know that God hears each and every one of them. We celebrate the birth of Margaret Spencer Brown, who is the daughter of Erica and Matthew Brown, and the proud grandparents are Rick and Chris Spencer. Congratulations on the birth of Margaret Spencer Brown. We express their sympathy to the family of Maggie Phillips. Maggie passed away last week, and there will be a service at a later date, so let us remember the family of Maggie Phillips. We also continue in prayer for Camille Redding, who is now at home from Baptist, and for George Bain, who had successful surgery last week, and for Francis Hensley, Charles Copel, who was at Baptist but is now at home, and for David Smith, who had knee surgery, and continued prayers for Beth Luck, who continues her treatments at UNC, and for Lowell Presnell, Susan McCrary, Janine Thompson, and Kathy Needham. We also lift up in prayer Joan Haynes, who continues to be under hospice care, and St. Luke member, Miss Margie Harris. Pray with me, please. Gracious, holy, loving God, we come before you this morning with our hearts full of joy and our hearts full of sadness, for that is the world in which we live where there are so many things to be grateful for, for the beautiful sunshine, for the rain which has come this week, for vegetables growing in gardens all over this town and this county, for children laughing and playing, and yet, in the midst of all the joy, we know that there are people who are not working. For those who are struggling to put food on the table, to keep roofs overhead, to stay well, to find good and decent medical care when needed. And so we live in this time right after we have proclaimed Independence Day, when we realized that perhaps we are not as independent as we thought, where we know that we need one another, and most of all, we need you, a loving, gracious, and good God, who cares for us, who reminds us to love ourselves, and to love one another with all that we have and all that we are. So on this day, O oh God, as we lift up our prayer requests to you, we do so knowing that we do so humbly, that we come before your throne, asking once again for your mercy and grace. As we remember those in our church family and in our community, who are hurting, for those in hospitals and nursing homes who are all alone this morning. We ask that you provide them a sense of your presence with them. For those 
who are in the midst of passing from this earth, from this earthly life, and then to your eternal kingdom. We ask for your peace to be with you. For those in this community who are struggling, we ask that you help us know how to serve well. For those in our families who are hurting, we ask for your guidance, for your help. And in all things, oh God, we ask that we may be the ones who lovingly and caringly and with generosity show your love to others. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who was, who is, and who is to come, and who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We live in an already but not yet time. We look around and see the healthy green crops of justice and peace, which struggle to grow and are mixed with weeds of violence and suffering. We wait like the farmer for the bountiful harvest of God's rain. And in the meantime, we work hard to nurture every little piece of hope. These gifts that we offer today are just one way that we tend the garden, the beautiful green garden of God, staking our hope on the future yield promised by God. Let us gather our gifts together and offer them to God in praise and thanksgiving.
through all of my failure and pride on a hill you created the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die and as you speak a hundred million If you like the gray behind you, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you've done. Every part designed in a work of art called love. If you gladly chose to surrender, so will I.
today we're going to take a good look at what it means to be called by God. If we have said yes to Jesus Christ, then we have answered God's call. We have answered God's call to accept Christ in our hearts, and we also answer God's call to love and to serve. And some of us have answered the call as being lay servant leaders in the church, which is so vital for God to be able to do God's work through the church into the world in Christ church. And some of us have answered the call to ordained ministry, to serve Christ in the church as an ordained elder or an ordained deacon. Uh, one year I was teaching confirmation and in confirmation class, I was trying to explain to the students about what it means uh, between to be clergy or laity and what the difference was and how we're equal but so both important to be able for the church to operate and to be a witness in the world. And so as I was explaining clergy and laity, well, uh, one of our young men piped up and he said, uh, I ain't no lady. I, does that mean I'm clergy? Uh, lady, L-A-D-Y. And so I had to explain it's laity uh, and so anyway, but both laity and clergy are called by God to use their gifts to build up the church and to build up the kingdom of God. When Jesus first called the first disciples, it, he looked at them and he said, follow me. And uh, it might even just appear, feel like they just picked up all their stuff and they left and followed Jesus. But following Jesus is never easy, and the disciples found that out, that it's never fall easy to follow Jesus because there is a cost to discipleship. Uh, we all have a call to follow, and our call to follow Jesus may play out in different ways. First, uh, all of us are called by God to seek God and to ask questions and to grow deeper in our faith as we grow in love with God more and more each day, we ask some deep questions. In Matthew 7, Jesus is speaking to the crowds in his Sermon on the Mount, and he paints a picture of what the kingdom of God is like. In verses 7 through 8, he says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and Everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. When Jesus encourages us to ask, I don't believe that he's telling us to ask for more shallow things that we want, but I think Jesus is genuinely pushing us to ask those burning questions within us. I used to think that questioning God or asking questions of God was not okay, but here we read that Jesus wants us to ask, and that when we ask him questions, we're gonna find something. I think of Sarah laughing at God and asking, how will I ever bear a child in my own age when she hears of God's plans for her? Or I think of the psalmist in Psalm 13 who cries out, my God, my God, will you forget me forever? How long, O Lord? And finally, I think of Jesus himself on the cross who cries out asking God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I wonder if Jesus knew that he would one day cry out like this when he was preaching about questions in his Sermon on the Mount. We're humans and there's going to be times we doubt and don't know the answers, but we worship a God who invites us to express them. Jesus also tells us to seek. When I was in college, there was a time in my life when I was not so sure about God. I felt called to ministry but had been shot down from it so many times and I wondered, is it even worth it? Does God even care about me? Is God even real? But I soon learned that seeking God was deeply intertwined with my questions. So I began to gather together with my friends as the sun was coming up before we headed off to class. And we prayed together and we shared our burdens and we just sat in the presence of God together. And it was there that I discovered that the God of mercy was ready to feel my questions. That this asking and seeking and knocking is about so much more than asking for temporary things about eternal, soul-filling, life-giving, holy nourishment that brings us into deeper communion with God when we're met with grace and our questions and doubts. And it was in those quiet moments, in these early hours of the day, that I felt God calling me to vocational ministry. I 
knew that God was calling me to encourage others to dig in, to ask questions, to seek God, and that God was calling me to make space for others to be able to do this. Even though Sarah laughed at God and wondered aloud about God's promises, she did in fact bear Isaac in her old age. And the psalmist in Psalm 13 ended in praise saying, but I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because the Lord has dealt bountifully with me. And as we know, Jesus is crying out on, crying out to God on the cross, did not end in anguish and death. Through God's radical act of grace, by rising Jesus from the dead, this ultimately shows us that God is willing to take on whatever junk we might bring to God. And finally, Jesus tells us to knock. That time in my life where I was questioning God has passed, but there I continue to ask questions of God, and I continue to have moments in my life where these questions are necessary, and I dig in and I continue to seek. Seeking after God, even in our questions, is hard work, especially when our cultural narrative is one that tells us that we're entitled to immediate gratification. This work of perseverance, this continual knocking, keeps us in tune with this ever eccentric and upside down kingdom of God that Jesus points us to. This kingdom of God is where we're invited to freely ask questions, where we're freely invited to always be seekers and where we're always met and held with grace. Though we're the ones knocking, it's ultimately not on us though. It's the one that we answer to that's always answering us and finding us in the unconventional ways that meet us with grace, even when we might not even be able to piece together words to express what we need. God knows what we need and meets us with this eternal holy nourishment, even in our questions and doubts. Amen. So we're called to ask questions. We're also called to be a witness and we're called to be obedient. And sometimes Jesus calls us to do something that we may or may not uh, want to do immediately. We might resist and sometimes have very good reasons to do so and good intentions. But then when we finally do surrender, God can use us in such a great way. Jonah 1 verses 1 through 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, my name is Alexis Coleman. I'm the new associate pastor here at First United Methodist Church. I'm looking forward to that time when we are all together in this space. My call to ordain ministry is very similar to Jonah's. It took God two tries to get me into ordain ministry. The first time, I ended up with a master's degree in Christian education from Pfeiffer University. Now that wasn't completely my fault, and I'll tell you that story when we have more time. The second time, though, when God called me into ordained ministry, I knew for a fact that I did not want to be a minister in a local church. And so I told God, you cannot make me. You cannot make me. In fact, when I went to begin meeting with my candidacy mentor, I told him at the very outset that I was going to become an ordained deacon, that I was going to do only the eight basic theological courses required for a deacon, for someone who was over 40, and that I was going to then do a PhD and I was going to teach college somewhere. My mentor, who also happened to be my minister at the time, just looked at me with kindness and grace and said, well, we'll see about that. And after a year of studying, of reading, of praying, of really working through what I was called to do, discerning what my call really was, I found, I found myself on a spring morning, signing a form, 
that said I would pursue elders' orders in the United Methodist Church. I learned through the process that whether you spend three days in the belly of a whale, whether you spend a year in prayer and in discernment, that God will have God's way when God calls. Thanks be to God. We're called to seek God. We're called to be a witness. We're called to answer God's call and to be equipped. And sometimes God might call us to uh, do something and we'll find excuses. We'll make excuses why we can't do something that God has called us to do. The scripture I have chosen for my call story is based on Exodus chapter 3 verses 1 through 15 with Moses at the burning bush. Hear now from Exodus chapter 3 verses 1 through 15. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked at the bush that was blazing Yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said, Father, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land and a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has come, has come now to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for that you, that it is I who sent you, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. Brothers and sisters, you know, a call is very unique. And it's very unique for every person. But every call shares certain characteristics. You know, a call is always personal and tailored to fit a person's soul. And a call is bigger than what we do for a living. It defines God's intentions for our lives. And our job is a way of pursuing our call. But so are our hobbies. The things that we do in our churches and in our communities and the ways that we interact with the world. It is not uncommon for people to resist their call. You know, we heard this morning, Moses did. Most people do resist their calling, and that's what I did. I feel like I most align with Moses and his call. The most frequent excuse I and others make are, is that we don't have the resources, we don't have the ability, we don't have the time or the courage to follow a calling. But it is through my experiences at camp as a youth and as a young college student that God worked in my life and it's where I found my calling into ministry. It was on a mountaintop back in 2007. 
on a mountaintop at Camp McCall in Bostick, North Carolina, where I felt the Spirit of the Lord come upon me and showed me a clear path of what I was being called to do. That God doesn't call the qualified, but he qualifies the called. For quite some time, I ignored the call because I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And I continued to make excuses about not feeling equipped to what Christ was sending me out to do. You know, while at camp and doing mission work, I gained something much more valuable than simple knowledge about God. I gained a desire to be in Christian community, a hunger to learn more, and the assurance that faith can make a difference in anyone's life. And I accepted that I had been called to do much greater things. And I could do it because God had called me to it and God was going to equip me to do what God had called me to do. God calls us to be a witness to the grace of Jesus Christ and there is some urgency to sharing God's love with others that others will need to know about this great love and there's urgency in us sharing the good news of Christ. A reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 1 and 2. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I first felt a call to ministry about a month before my 16th birthday. My mom had told me in no uncertain terms that I was going to be attending church camp with the youth group at the New Methodist Church that we were attending. I was raised in a church going family and I was pretty sure that I believed in God, but I just wasn't sure about the whole Christian faith thing. At camp, I was seeking answers to these myriad questions that I had. And I turned to an adult chaperone who was in seminary at the time. In the midst of our conversation, I said, I wish that I could go to seminary, not to become a pastor, but just to learn and get some answers to these questions. And as soon as I said that, I felt God say to me, you are going to go to seminary, but not just to learn. You're gonna be a pastor. It wasn't a dramatic moment. I didn't shake or fall to the ground or start speaking in tongues. Actually, the truth of the call was communicated to me in this simple clarity that I felt. All of a sudden, it seemed like I had always planned on being a pastor, and I suddenly couldn't imagine any other path. That week at camp, after experiencing the presence of God more strongly than I had ever had before, I not only heard my call, but I surrendered my life to Jesus and got on board with all that God was doing in my life. We had the chance to share a testimony of what we had experienced that week. And I wrote down my story with the only writing implement that I had available, a purple crayon. I've been following this call now for about eight years. And in that time, I've learned so much. I went to Belmont University in Nashville and earned a bachelor's degree in biblical studies with a minor in biblical languages. Now I'm halfway through my education at Duke Divinity School, and I've even had the chance to study theology in Scotland. But as much as I love theology, the most meaningful words I've ever written were those scrawled out on scrap paper to describe the love of God shed abroad in my heart. Today, I feel God's call not to come proclaiming the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, but with the simple urgency of a testimony written in purple crayon. We are all called by God, both clergy and laity. And some of us are called to specific ministries and some of us are called to do certain things, but all of us are called by God to be faithful Christians in the world. 
I've heard some people express frustration recently over the lack of compassion and kindness from some people in our society, especially in these trying times that we are currently living. As Christians, we are all called by God to be kind and compassionate. I've heard people say and do things that are very hurtful and very harmful while they're wearing their Jesus Saves t-shirt, uh, so opposite of what Jesus calls us to be when we say hurtful and harmful things. If all Christians would follow the call by God to be kind and compassionate, just think how that would change the whole world. My life personally has been changed and challenged by this call to be kind and compassionate derived from the very teachings of Christ and also from what Paul writes in Ephesians 4. Paul writes in Ephesians in this chapter about how to live out a call, instructions for discipleship, and how to live out a life of faithfulness, allowing our hearts to be in tune with God's heart. And then Paul ends chapter 4 with this statement. He says, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as Christ has forgiven you. This scripture in Ephesians has really shaped what I believe God calls me personally to be and to do as a Christian and as a pastor. I, I was called into ministry when I was about 11 or 12 years old I don't remember how old I was really. I knew I wasn't quite in uh, junior high school yet, so I must have been about 11, maybe 12. Uh, I, um, I come from a long line of Methodists. My great-grandfather was a circuit rider in what is now the Western North Carolina Conference. His name was Francis Asbury Lindsay Clark. Uh, you can't get much more Methodist than that. So my family attended First United Methodist Church Mount Holly because that was my great-grandfather's last stop on his circuit ride and uh, on his circuit and my grandmother, his daughter, married my grandfather uh, who was from Mount Holly. And so that's why my family's from Mount Holly is because of my great-grandfather's circuit. But when I was 12, uh, 11 or 12 years old, I was sitting in church one Sunday morning with my father and my older brother and my younger sister and my mom was on the organ up front we were in the fellowship hall we were worshiping in the fellowship hall at that time because the church had not yet built its beautiful sanctuary and as i sat there this morning uh, i can't that morning i can't really describe uh really uh in words about what happened but uh, I knew that God wanted me to serve Christ in Christ's church. I was sitting there and watching the pastor up front. He was preaching a sermon. I really don't know what it was about, but I was sitting there listening, being still, and, and trying to pay attention. My sister, who was about four or five, was not being still. But So I was sitting there listening, and uh, I knew that morning that God was calling me and I didn't know it was a call uh, what it was what it was but that God wanted me to serve Christ in Christ's church and so I prayed that morning in my childlike way I uh, said uh, something like I promise you God to serve you or I've promised to um, serve you in your church and when confirmation day came a few years later uh, my I knelt at the altar in that fellowship hall next to my best friend, David Garrett, who David uh, and I grew up together, went to Carolina together, and he passed away just a few years ago, about three years ago. And But we both committed our life to Christ uh, during that confirmation service, and I also committed my life to serve Christ in, in the church. So when people would ask me when I was young what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would answer, uh, I want to be a minister or I want to be a pastor. And unfortunately, the response I would often receive was, uh, okay, um, well, how about being a Christian educator instead? Isn't there something else you want to do? And they would say, why don't you go to Pfeiffer? All my aunts and uncles had gone to Pfeiffer. My mom and my grandmother had gone to Pfeiffer. And 
My mom played the organ in the chapel there. And they said, go to a Pfeiffer and be a Christian educator. And I thought, well, that, that's good. But I knew that I was supposed to be doing what the pastor was doing. Uh, or they would tell me that I could be a missionary. What do you want to be when you grow up? A pastor? And they'd say, well, why don't you be a missionary? And, well, I am more of a homebody than you'll ever meet. <laughs> uh, I didn't like being very far from home. I still don't, to be honest. I have done a lot of traveling, but I always travel with family or with close friends. So the idea of going to some foreign country to be a missionary was not anything close to what I knew that I could do. And so when I told people I wanted to be a minister when I was a, a young child, uh, I simply did not receive much encouragement. And of course, this was during the early 70s and there were not many ordained women. We'd never seen a woman pastor. Uh, not, uh, the Methodist uh, church had been ordaining women since 1956, but uh, we had never uh, been, uh, didn't know anything about that and so I don't say that with any kind of complaint or regret but it was just the way it was back then and so no one meant to discourage me but they just did not know what to do with me uh, I did receive some affirmation in some places though during when I was a youth about 14 or 15 uh, I told one of my pastors Reverend Kenneth Krauss that I I knew that God wanted me to serve Christ in the church and be a pastor like him. And so he would allow me to uh, come in his study and look at all his theological books. And I would stand there in his library. He had a great library. And he would hand me a book and say, here, take this book and, and read it. So I would take it home and I would read it. And I uh, didn't quite understand it all, of course. But it meant the world to me, and I can't explain this either, but when I was standing there one day looking at all his books and knowing that this was what God was calling me to do, to study uh, God and to study God's Word, I was filled with the Holy Spirit one day, and I was just overwhelmed, and I knew that studying God's Word in detail and serving the people of God and sharing God's love was what God wanted me to do with my whole life. A few years ago, I was honored to stand when Reverend Kenneth Krause's name was called at annual conference as he had joined the church triumphant that year. I eventually graduated from UNC Chapel Hill and I ignored my call to ministry for several years for different reasons. and. Uh, earning, uh, I earned a master's degree in computer science uh, in the mid-1980s, and I worked as a software engineer for uh, about 11 years. And although I enjoyed my engineering work, I knew that was not what God wanted me to do, and so I filled my life with uh, serving in the church, of course, and uh, I was doing everything in the church. I was uh, teaching adult Bible studies. I was teaching children Sunday school. I was chaperoning youth, sleeping on floors on mission trips. I uh, was mopping the fellowship hall. I was doing everything probably except for cooking. Uh, but I knew that I wasn't doing enough in the church, that, that God was calling, had called me to do uh, something else. So when my children, my daughters, were about five and seven, my youngest was entering kindergarten, I came home from work one afternoon and I just knelt in my living room and I gave my life to Christ in full-time service. I vowed to serve God completely with my life, forsaking my career as an engineer and uh, placing my family's future in all aspects in God's control. And so what, and that day, what a peace washed over me as I knelt on my living room floor. I then applied to Duke Divinity and I've been serving Christ in the church for over 20 years now, fulfilling my promise to God that came to me, that I gave to God, the call that came to me as a child so many years ago. We are all called by God. We are all called to, to serve God. And over the years, my call uh, to ministry, my call as a pastor, my call as a Christian 
has been shaped by the scripture to love all the teachings that Christ has given to us to love one another and to love God and the teachings of Paul to be kind and compassionate forgiving as Christ has forgiven me for we are all called by God to love and Jesus is still in the business today of calling people of saying come follow me God is still calling people to serve in all capacities, some to ordain ministry and some to uh, many people to be leader uh, in the leaders in the church to uh, servant leadership. So you know, and some of us are called to do things like sleep on the floor uh, on a mission trip with our youth. Some are called by God to hold a child and rock that child in the nursery. Some of us are called by God to make googly-eyed pipe cleaner crafts with kindergartners with messy glue and glitter all over the floor. Some of us are called by God to cook a meal for the rest of us to eat. Some of us are called by God to sit and to listen, to help one another. Some of us are called by God to study God's word and to lead a Bible class. Some of us are called to sing and some of us are called by God to play the guitar or to play the organ. And some of us are called to fix the air conditioner or to build a columbarium. But we are all called by God we are called by God to be loved, to know that we are loved by God. We are called by God to love one another. We are called by God to love God with all that we are and all that we have. We are called by God to love and to serve. We are called by God and what a blessing it is that God knows each of us by name and God calls us to love. And God calls us each and every day to love and to serve. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, thank you, God, for calling us. Amen.
being called by God, may we now show others this great love. May we serve God with all that we are and all that we have, loving God and loving one another. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.